Welcome to Black and the Black Times Infinity. I'm your host, Cthulhu's Prodigy. Alongside me, we have Stitch, Old Ninja, Blue, and Kronos. And this is another special S-Class interview. We have the incredible Echo Kellum from CW's Arrow, who plays Curtis and Mr. Terrific on there. What's up, fam? Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Man, we are excited. We have been Arrow fans since forever. Day one. Day yes, one. Yes, for real. Oh. <laughs> Very cool. Let, let's jump right on in. Uh, so, okay. yep. first quick question, man. Uh, can you tell us what it was like filming that Prometheus slash throwing star killer assassination scene with Curtis and his husband? Uh, I think it was on the fin- mid-season finale from this year. What was that like filming? You know, that. what's really interesting about that scene, it was very surreal for me. Um, it was really cool. I mean, Prometheus, like, looks freaking terrifying even though i like i know the actor and everything like that just like seeing that suit i'm like oh crap this looks scary um but what was really cool is like there's this moment where i'm laying down on the ground because you know he attacked me and they're setting up a shot and it's raining and i just like look up and see all this like beautiful rain just falling on my face and like all the cameras around me and then it's like really this this kind of moment where i like just kind of have this epiphany of like holy crap this is like so dope that I get to do this and, you know, be involved in a cool show, like villains and heroes and, you know, like life and death stakes and everything like that. And I just remember just kind of sitting back looking up, just kind of out of body experience, like, whoa, dude, you get to do this. And that, that was just such a cool scene to shoot. Um, and that's like one of my favorite episodes we've ever had to work, that I ever, ever got to work on Arrow. It was really challenging and kind of very emotional episode too you know i come from a big comedy background so i don't usually have to do too much of that but it, it was really awesome and our director antonio i think he did such a great job with it but that scene in particular was something i look upon like very fondly okay so on the show um your character has a t-shaped mask on now is now around the table i've been saying that you're actually wearing a mask but they keep saying that it's like a face paint or like a, a grease that you're wearing mm-hmm. what exactly are you wearing on yeah. your face to make the t-shape it's it's a prosthetic mask. They have to glue it on top. Damn, blue was right. Blue was <laughs> right. Damn. Right. Guess who just won a hundred dollars? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there is they they do like paint some parts of it like around like kind of around my lips and stuff like that. But for the most part, yeah, it's like pretty much a full prosthetic team mask that they put on. Nice. I, I, I'm going to ask the question that uh, we've asked a, a lot of our fan base and even on Twitter, and, and uh, it seems to be the most popular question that we wanted to ask uh, you as your character is, can you explain who braids Curtis's hair? So and, fast. And how does he get it done so quickly? It's it's unbelievable to us. <laughs> I'm not surprised that's the question. You know, in my, in my brain, my canon, I don't know if you guys ever saw this um, Lord Mesa drawing that he did but basically there's a machine that felicity and curtis worked up that does his brain before he goes out in my head um <laughs> and then some other stuff is that maybe the flash comes in up before it goes out but i get that question non-stop oh. <laughs> <laughs> I I bet. yeah there's it, i mean <laughs> it's a hotly debated topic like so many fans are like everyone's got their theory my theory was flash just comes in braids you up and then dips <laughs> and we just don't see it because it's so quick. Yeah. He, he he has the time to do all that. He definitely can come do it. I mean, not, not him, Kid Flash. Or, you, know, <laughs> or them, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> yeah. See, my theory was that uh, he, because in the comic books, the character has nanotechnology, and I think he has, like, the little nano bugs go through and braid his hair real quick before he goes out on his missions. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mark. It's that's the mark. Yeah. <laughs> pitch it, pitch it. And like the teeth spheres are like braiding his hair somehow. Like that'd be so dope. <laughs> yeah. So you had talked about earlier uh, the Prometheus episode or the mid-season finale and how that was an, an emotional episode. Um, we were wondering like where does Curtis go after the ultimatum that his husband gave him? Like where's he going mean, to be like emotional? I definitely see Curtis and uh a darker place than he normally is because, you know, it's a pretty pretty intense moment for him. You're going to see him kind of questioning what he's doing because hmm. of the loss of his husband, if he even should be on the team. Um, but I think that it really is a thing that it really makes him happy, you know, and that's what he's telling his husband. is like it's just exhilarating to be out there, and it's something he never thought he would do, but something that I don't think he could turn off. But 
I think Curtis will have to figure out a readjustment to being a vigilante just so, you know, he can kind of stay out of the hospital and <laughs> stop getting stabbed and, you know, hurt up. So he's going to have to kind of figure out what's the best path forward for him as a vigilante so he can actually be a, a, a welcome contribution to the team. Cool. Your your character in the show does a uh, quite a bit of a martial martial arts in the show. Did did you do any training for that, or how, how did or did you have a martial arts background in general before the show? Well, I used to study like karate when I was a kid, but um, I kind of fell off that after I was like thirteen, fourteen. But when um, we came back to season, they had a study in boxing, Krav Maga, uh, Wei Chong, and stuff like that. So they had us really going through the pace. We're still we're still like training and stuff like that. So. They definitely have us go through the paces of it all and, like, really bone up on, like, our, our fighting skills. So that's one of the dopest things that I got to do is just, like, really be in the gym and hitting it up and practicing and training, and it's really awesome. Nice. Well, I, I respect where, you, where you're coming from on the fitness stuff, but here's my question, man. Who is the best on that salmon ladder? Because, I mean, you, you bring it in every episode, but, but who's the best actor on that, on that salmon ladder? Who's the best on it? Yes. I mean, come on, man. Steven Amell. Ah. <laughs> Seven letters. Well, you saw Wild Dog use it once, and he did a pretty good job on there. Yeah, Wild Dog did his thing. Wild Dog did his thing. But, like, Steven Amell was, like, teaching Rick how to do it and stuff like that. But, yeah, Steven, like, this fool, like, can do it with a full suit on, with like, a whatever. He just got it. He's got it. Damn. Nice. You settled that. That's yeah. hilarious. It sounds like you guys have a really good chemistry on the set and off of just like looking at like Instagram and, and Facebook posts and everything. Uh, Not from that we're stalking you. <laughs> <laughs> just from various, <laughs> just from various, uh, just peeping into every everything that we've seen from uh, all the actors on set. Can you tell us like who do you think is like I guess the funniest actor on set? And you have any like uh, weird weird moments that you can share with uh, with us? I mean, for me, I think. Emily's probably the funniest person on set. She's just so silly. She's just... I mean, but really, the honest to God truth is every single person on set is hilarious. Yes. Like, every time I work with anyone, we're cracking jokes, being stupid, and dirt. I mean, like, it's such a fun set to work on. And I really think that Steven kind of set the precedent for that because he just really... Regardless of how he might seem to yeah. everyone... <laughs> He is such a wonderful captain on our show and one of the silliest, dumbest people out there. <laughs> like willing to go for any joke or show some weird internet videos and stuff like that. So we have a ton of fun when we're shooting. I think that's the part I like the most about it is that we all just have such a wonderful time working with each other and hanging out with each other. But hands down, I think like Emily and I have the closest comedic sensibility. So People literally, like, when, when we're about to shoot, they're like, oh, God, here comes Emily and I go, well, here we go, guys. You know, we're just, like, so silly. We love to have fun. I think that's a big part of it. The nuttiest person is John Barrowman, hands down. Like, Ooh. I worked with him for just two episodes last year, and it was two episodes I'd never forget. <laughs> because, first, he's so good at what he does. and such a phenomenal actor and so professional. But as soon as they call cut... He is an insane person, period. <laughs> he's just going insane, and it's so much fun. Now, recently, uh, we just had the giant crossover between all four shows that are running on the CW, Supergirl, Flash, uh, Legends of Tomorrow, and Arrow. How was it working with the different casts from the different shows? Like, did the chemistry change in the in your work environment, or was it still pretty chill and laid back? I mean, that really was a dream come true for me, man. Um I mean, I feel like for us, just because I, I was just on the Arrow crossover, for us it was pretty much the same uh, energy because we just had guests coming in. It's still kind of like our well-oiled machine, and so I didn't really get to see how, like, the sets would be, like, on Flash or Legend Tomorrow, but I know that everyone who came in pretty much just hit the ground running. I mean, they, it was it was just very easy to work off Grant and Melissa and – because everyone, I think, really enjoys the job and really enjoys having fun playing these characters. And those crossovers are something I think we all take a lot of pride in, trying to make them the best they can be for the fans. And, and it's just something that it's really easy. It doesn't feel contrived or like somebody's coming off, going off our rhythm. It, it just really, they all flow so well. And I think the, the same can be said as far as the people from Arrow who did go to Legends or Flash and stuff like that. I think... It's just they're such well-oiled machines that when people come in and guess, it just still just keeps clicking, and that, that's what I felt like with Grant and everybody. Mm. Wow, right on. So in season four, um, 
going to refer back to some of the, the stunt work that you're doing. Um, in season four, there's the episode Beacon of Hope. It's the episode with all the bees. And uh, Curtis does this weird corkscrew flip over uh, Felicity's desk. Now, was that you? Because that really looked like you really up close. Was that your stunt double? <laughs> you know, that that one was probably the stunt double, even though they had me do it and land and stuff like that. But I think the dope one was the stunt double, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, have no, I have no qualms in admitting that. I mean, our stunt guys do so much. They're so amazing on that show. And, I mean, they really put their whole heart and soul in it. For me, anything that will let me do, I'm definitely game to do it because I love being active and, like, getting out there trying different things. But... You know, for them, they have to be careful in aspects of what they let us do because, you know, if one of us gets injured, you know, production has to shut down for oh, weeks man. and it costs them millions of dollars. And so they have to be, you know, very diligent. And I think there was this, this incident where there was this film shooting out in Vancouver, which is where we film, called Blade Runner. And the main mm-hmm. actor did this stunt where he had to jump across a car and literally miss and have to have facial reconstruction surgery. Ooh. The movie's been delayed for a year and a half. Damn. You know, so they're kind of cautious sometimes because, you know, um, if a stunt guy misses, I mean, sadly, a stunt guy can still get hurt, but they can still continue production, you know. But that's the thing is that when you have one of the main characters get hurt, it can really throw everything into a tailspin. Mm-hmm. So they, they're pretty careful, but I, I want to do every stunt that will allow me to do, though, personally. <laughs> <laughs> right on. All right. So I'm going to ask you this question, but it's not actually my question. All right. But people keep asking me, um, do you – Commonly get mistaken for Richard Ayoade from from the IT, the IT crowd, the guy who plays Maurice on the IT crowd. Yeah. <laughs> do people always think you're him? Do I what? Do people always think that you're that you guys look like each other? Because oh, people keep oh, asking me, why, and I'm just like, dude, I've gotten that at least a dozen times in the past three years for <laughs> sure. Like I had a guy stop me on the street and say, "Man, I loved your movie Submarine." And I'm like, <laughs> I. Did direct that. Also, <laughs> I wish I did. You know, so I, I've definitely got Richard Aoyde multiple times for sure. I don't get it. I don't think you guys are looking the same to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what's weird? I also get the weekend sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Stop, stop, man. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait, the weekend don't wear glasses? <laughs> <laughs> and your hair doesn't look like coral reef. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so I mean, no, definitely no, no black people ever ask me to. Like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say too. It's all white people that ask me. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, but Mr. Terrific, in my opinion, is one of like the ultimate black nerds on like uh, uh, TV. And you have John Diggle, who seems like this ultimate soldier and veteran and whatnot. What do you think works so well with both characters being on Team Arrow? And why are we our audiences finally okay with having two black male? Uh, characters on the same team for a superhero show? I mean, you know, that for a long time, is the industry used to think if you had two black people on the show, it was a black show for some reason. Um, but I think in the last, like, couple years, five, six, seven years, they've really kind of dialed back from that. And that's a really, I think, a, a great thing. It shows you a lot of progress we've made, even though there's still a ton to go. Um, but I think really, man, I mean, I think Greg Berlanti has such an amazing vision for these shows, and he's a very all-inclusive, brilliant writer and creator, and I think that he really set the tone for that, on top of the fact that I think David Ramsey is a phenomenal actor. I think he brings so much to Diggle. Diggle was my favorite character before I came on the show, and I just love just watching everything that he go through and how much he brings to that character, man. But, you know, it's really the writers who I feel like really, you know, have a pulse on it, and the executives who are willing to let go whatever old practices that used to be in Hollywood and say, hey, you know, we can do whatever we want. You have a, a ton of diversity in the show, and that doesn't make it anything other than a diverse show, you know, and that's what we should have with more shows. So I really think it's a lot of credit to Greg and Mark and the writers and then also David. I can't really pump myself up because that's just too, self, that's too self, you know, uh, uh, confident and all like that, but I really think they really bring a lot to it and help us step into those roles very easily and, and that allows the fans to really like them and dig them a lot. Nice. Wow. That's cool. So uh, on your Twitter feed, it says that you have a little bit of a comedian 
or comic background, uh, what are some of your, your influence when it comes to uh, comedy? You said what well, my influence is when it came to comedy? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, growing up in Living Color mm-hmm. was one of the first shows I ever saw where I was like, I need to do this. Like, I used to go to school and mimic every Jim Carrey character he did on that <laughs> show. Damn. Fire Marshal Bill, Vera Wang, whoever, I would do them all. And then, like, really watching Will Smith and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Mm. That was where I was like, man, I want to be an actor. I want to do what he does. I want to be like him, you know, and that that really helped me kind of figure out that there's the path I want. But when I started off, I started off doing more dramatic work in Chicago and theater. Um, and then I moved to L.A. in 2009, and then I, I just started studying at every comedy theater out here from UCB to I.O. West to Groundlings and I've always been naturally funny, and that was just something I just kind of learned the language more and kind of learned the industry standards of comedy, and it's just something that I, I just felt very natural with and love playing different characters and doing stuff like that. So I really look back to those influences and just dive in 100%. Like, I stopped going to the movies. I stopped going <laughs> out. Like, all I did was all I did was breathe and eat comedy. I was at wow, the comedy dedicated. club. Every day of the week, if I wasn't there, I was practicing in rehearsal groups for improv or sketch. Like, I literally just dived 100% in when I moved out to L.A. Now, are you still doing comedy, or are you just mainly focusing on the show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have two shows every week, Friday and Saturday night. Friday at uh, UCB, Upright Citizens Brigade in uh, Hollywood, and then Saturday at IOS in Hollywood. Oh, cool. Check that out one day. You have to go to SoCal and check that out. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yep, definitely. Please. Yeah. Uh, so I I don't know if this is true, but is is it true that some of the cast and crew have gotten death threats from like really out of line fans? Is there any truth to that? <laughs> you know, I've I've never heard anything personally that anyone's gotten, but I would not be surprised because some of our fans are so rabid about <laughs> the the side that they choose. Hmm. But I don't think there's been any real legitimate death threats, I don't think. Uh, so no one's, no one's told me about it. But, I mean, obviously, you know, we do get sent hate and some stuff sometime over social media. But it's such a small percentage of what everyone else sends. Like, we, I think it's about 98% positivity and love that I see on Twitter and stuff like that. But you're always going to have your 2% of just internet trolls and people yeah. who just aren't happy with themselves who just feel like, oh, i got to reach out to you guys and try to say some – Crap, you know, better. but it, it comes with the territory. I think if people aren't passionate, then your show's probably canceled. And mm. you're like, crap, I need a job, you know. So I'm totally fine to take the good with the bad in that regard. You let your haters be your motivators? <laughs> Say it again? You let your haters be your motivators, it sounds like. That, that's good. Yeah, let the haters motivate. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Haters motivate, man. It's so true. So true. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we, as you said before, we can tell you're really dedicated to your craft with your comedic background and, and your uh, background in, in, in drama and everything. Uh, on, on more of a serious note, uh, as you portraying a gay black male character for one of the first times in comic book based TV series, what's it like? And was there any pressure that you felt to portray Curtis in a certain way? If you could give us a little bit of an insight, I guess, on that, if there was a, a little bit of added weight on your shoulders. You know what's what's great about the pressure or anything like that is, you know, when I went into audition for it, they didn't say it was gay or anything. It just it was just this character who works with Felicity, and I just went in there and approached him like this kind of nerdy tech guy, and I didn't play up any of that. I didn't know there was anything to play up. I was like, oh yeah, it's just this guy. And then when I came back and auditioned for it again with the producers, at the end of it, they let me know like, hey, by the way. Uh, this character will become Mr. Terrific. And I was like, because I, I was familiar with Mr. Terrific, I was like, shut up, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, like, kind of shot. And then they were like, and also he's gay. And I was like, oh, dope, that's right, you know? And the cool thing was is there was no different tilt, no other way to play it other than what I presented and what I thought the character was. And that was, I think, the coolest thing about it is not trying to play up any type of, the gay best friend! That's <laughs> <laughs> wrong with that there are totally uh some lgbtq people who are sassy and stuff like that but not everyone's like that and i think right. it's cool to see a, a wealth of differences amongst even the lgbt community and that's why i like playing character i mean playing curtis just as kind of an offshoot of me not trying to play up anything because that is more so reality 
you know, like they come, uh, LGBT people come in all different shapes, sizes, creeds, and I just like seeing Curtis played up as just a person, you know, and he just happens to be gay, you know, and that's, that's something I take a lot of pride in and playing him because I, I don't think I would have felt comfortable trying to play a stereotype or anything like that, you know? All right, all right. So you're a self-proclaimed nerd. Uh, what makes you nerdy, I guess? What are some of your uh, your nerd credentials that you can share with us? Well, I mean, well, firstly, I worked at the Geek Squad for four years. Nice. Uh, so that's nerd credential number one. <laughs> so I grew up, you're a chuck. I grew up watching anime since I was eight years old. Ooh, wait, 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 hold on. To be or Ninja Scroll or oh, nice. reading comic books and... You know, uh, playing Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Pokemon. I mean, I and also getting my ass kicked in high school. That's a big part. <laughs> <laughs> you know because it was not cool. It was not cool when I was in high school. You know, but it, it's just something that I've connected with my entire life. You know, that just the nerd culture and it's just a part of what me and my core group of friends have always been. Like we were always the comic book nerds at school who would bring comic books and give them to kind of the bullies and be like, dude, you just see the new Spider-Man or dude, look what Apocalypse is doing, you know? And yeah. It kind of made us a little cool, but they still picked on us. But Damn. it's something that I've just been, you know, connected with my entire life. But my number one nerd quality is video games. Oh. Yes. Oh. Video games are life. Video <laughs> games are my shit, period, no matter what. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you playing right now? Right now, uh, I just beat Xenoverse 2. Oh, I'm still trying to beat the uh, Blood and Wine DLC of The Witcher 3. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, uh, snap. Probably just jumped oh, out of seat. Yeah. Because I already beat Witcher. so good. Uh, but that Final Fantasy 15 is pretty lit. I've been playing that right now. It's oh. really great. Um, oh. Just getting into that and trying to finish Fallout 4 as well. So, oh. wait, are you like an old school RPG fan? Because you named off a lot of RPGs. Wait, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely old school RPG. I was just, me and my friends, just like, in the, we use Boxer. We just name, like, our 10 favorite RPGs and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm a big, big RPG fan. Whether Damn. it's right, hold, Final wait. Fantasy VII or Grandia II or Skies of Arcadia, whatever, man. I, I love all RPGs. Wow. Wait, so wh- which one do you think is better, Final Fantasy VI or Final Fantasy VII? Ooh. Man, I'm a Final Fantasy VII fan, personally. Oh. I agree. I used to tag in Chicago. <laughs> I used to tag. I used to graffiti in Chicago. My tag name was Safara. So. <laughs> oh, this guy is fam fam. Oh, that's yeah, you, better, you better watch out. The PD might be looking for you, trying to connect you to some crimes. <laughs> Damn, you do have serious credentials, man. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Wait, what do you know about that? I got to ask, what do you know about that Mass Effect, though? Oh, dude. Come on, man. Come down to Shepard, dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I, I have a Mass Effect jacket, man. You know what's so funny? I um, also have this uh, Gears of War backpack that I got at E3. Ooh, and I was on a plane, like, two months ago. And I had my Gears of War bag, and I was putting it in um in my little carry-on or whatever. And this guy sees it, and he's like, hey, where'd you get that bag from? I was like, oh, I got it from E3. And he's like, I'm... I'm the head of, of Gears of War. Like, I'm the head of the studio that does it. And he gave me a free copy, Ultimate Edition of Gears of War 4. Oh, my god! A goodness. month before it came god out. God damn. A man. month before it came out. Just grabbing a jacket on? That's sweet. Yeah, he had the bag. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's that's me some merch. Yeah. I know, right? Gotta get that merch. <laughs> that's crazy. That's awesome, mm-hmm. actually. I'm that's like... That's- I'm going to start wearing a Janet Jackson jacket on all the time in case I run into her. <laughs> and running someone on her squad. <laughs> That's awesome. So, actually, uh, part two of the members of our podcast, uh, Old Ninja and Prodigy, we actually had a chance to make it to uh, Comic-Con this past year. We saw we barely got into the panel that Arrow had, and you guys were in Ballroom 20, and that place was super packed. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Man, that was, Comic-Con was one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. You know, I, I've been there as a fan twice before then, but never in that capacity, you know. Um, it was just so cool to get to, like, just hang out with the people from Walking Dead and Games of Thrones and, and all this stuff like that. It was just so surreal, man. And then just the fans, man, just all the love that the fans shower on you, man. It, it was nonstop, and the parties are, like, the best part is you got all here. It's just so much fun, man. I, I literally had a blast. I walked the floor on the last day and got some swag and stuff like that. It, it was, it was, it was, um, you know, like the stuff dreams are made of, man. I kept pinching myself like I can't believe I got to do that, you know. 
Um, but yeah, that that was definitely one of the highlights of my career. That's what, awesome. How did you manage to walk the floor without getting mobbed? I mean, you know, I um, I've always walked the floor at conventions. You know, that's just been I just like to be there with the fans, man, because I'm a fan of a lot of that stuff too. And it was a little tough, like, because I. I walk a couple steps and I, I get stopped and you know people take pictures and stuff like that. But it was really cool just to just to be there with everyone. I mean, I just I just love you know like that's why usually if I, if we're not too busy, like I love to like just hit, hit people back on Twitter and like Instagram because honestly, our truth is if not for fans, we're just rehearsing. Mm, we're not yeah. putting anything out there. If no one's watching, if no one cares, we're not working. You know, so it's kind of a way for me to stay connected with the fans and to give something back to them. Um, it's really cool, like, when you just, when someone just, like, you responded to me made my day, or you just taking the time to say hi to my son made him want to do this, or, you know, whatever. It's just a, a really cool feeling, and I think we all as actors and creators and people in this industry need to show love for, because without them, we're, we're just rehearsing. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That That's really beautiful. I, I had another quick question. This is almost the last one because I know we're running out of time. Uh, the DC uh, Extended Universe, uh, we have not heard anything about a Mr. Terrific uh, for the big screen. Would you be willing to play Mr. Terrific on screen, and what differences would you perhaps like to see uh, on if the uh, Mr. Terrific was in the movies? Um, did you, okay, I, I think I heard it because you said, would I like to play Mr. Terrific, and is there anything different I would like to see with him in the movie versus the TV show? Yes. Well, yeah, I, I would love to, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely like to play any, I mean, I would play Thug number two. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, put me in the movie. Please, put me in the movie. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, but as far as the Terrific, dude, that'd be cool. Like, that'd be so dope to actually step into the fray of the of actual features and do it. Um... I think for me, the, the part that I would like to see about Mr. Terrific in the movies is like his ability to go through, you know, different dimensions and really delve, delve into that. His aspect of when he's more of the complete version of himself. You know, I think in Arrow, our version of Mr. Terrific is kind of trying to figure it all out and figure out what makes him Mr. Terrific. And, and in the movie, I like to see him kind of more in place and settled and have done it for years and kind of just be that badass that we all know from the comic books like straight from the jump. Nice. Mm-hmm. All right, Blue, do you have a last one? Last question? Yeah, quick uh, before we wrap it up here. Um, so, you know, you talk about like playing games, reading comics. Did you have to like research uh, Mr. Terrific? Like, did you go back and like read a bunch of his comics or like how did you actually research oh, yeah. the role? Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I read, I reread the comic probably three or four times. Went through all the other JSA stuff that I hadn't read. I, like once I booked, I went out and bought everything that had anything to do with Mister Terrific in it. You know, um, but yeah, you know his story is so great, and I'm, I'm you know bummed that he didn't get another volume. You know, Mind Games is the only guy. I wish he would have got some more because he really is an in-depth, cool-ass character, man. And just seeing some of the stuff he does in the JSA and whatnot, I just want to follow more of his story and see, you know, what what's next for him. Man, you, you do have some serious man, yeah. We are impressed. Yes. Yeah. You got a um, PhD in it. <laughs> where can uh, folks find you on social media and, uh, you know, shout you out and whatnot? Your phone number, your home address. <laughs> <No>. Gamer tag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You want stalkers, right? <laughs> Here's my social. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, on Twitter, I'm Echo K, Instagram, Echo Kel. That's, I think those are pretty much the only two I do for the most part, yeah. I used to do Snapchat a ton, but then everyone just got annoyed when you kept Snapchat and everything. And I was like, okay, I don't want to be that annoying guy who's always trying to videotape it. Like, you know. I, I got you. Nice. Man, we appreciate the hell out of you. You know we're going to be watching. Uh, when does Arrow come back on for season uh, the rest of the season? J- J- January 25th. Then when we come back and we ride out through the rest. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Right. We can't wait. We're going to be live tweeting and watching. Yes. Oh, Thank sure. you for your time. We oh, really man. appreciate it. I mean, you really come off as a really awesome, humble, uh, just knowledgeable geek fan. Like Everything. one of us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And please, please tell. Thank you so much, man. Please tell Emily that Stitch is in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> now he ain't gonna never get on the show. Yeah, I know, right? Now she's never. <laughs> Thank you so much, Echo. Awesome, man.
Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All, All right, right. You have, you have a good one. Have a good one. All right. All right, guys, stay up. Peace. Right. Man at last has succeeded in penetrating further and further into the unknown vastness of space.